Welcome to the finals for the championship of the civilized world. That's why we're here today. What a great crowd. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, for those of you who weren't here for the first two rounds, the qualification rounds, we have eight finalists from the first two rounds of 3MT, or Three Minute Thesis. And uh, at risk of being repetitious to those who were here before, the beauty of this is that it is delivering a very complex message in a way that a lay but obviously intelligent audience uh, can understand. And um, it really is quite enjoyable. I, I think you'll agree. My name is Tony Doucette, and I have this device which advances the slides. And since I'm a low-tech kind of person, I'm really quite jazzed at that opportunity. I host the morning radio show on CBC Radio here in Windsor. It's called The Early Shift, and I want to thank uh, Allison Sampson and Patty Weir again for the invitation to be a part of this. It really is great fun. Um, I should say that in calling this the championship of the civilized world, we're assuming that undiscovered primitive peoples aren't doing this. So uh, I guess we can make that assumption. Now, those who are presenting today will have been practicing at some length. In the audience, of course, uh, we have not been practicing at all. So I'd urge you to perhaps just take a shot, of, shot at uh, showing some appreciation for a performance you really appreciate. Mm. Uh, no, I mean a, a performance you truly appreciate. That's it. Much better. Much better. I want to begin by thanking the sponsors of 3MT, or the Three Minute Thesis, CBC Radio, my employer, to whom I have in, am eternally grateful, the Office of the Provost, the Office of the Vice President Research, the GSS Alumni Endowment Fund, and the Center for Teaching and Learning. One very important bit of detail, many of us are carrying these. Please do something to them so that they don't create an interruption. Ideally, turn them off. We would like to sort of come among you with a bucket and take them all, but that's just not practical. So if you could just mute them, turn them off altogether, that would be great. A bit of history of the uh, three-minute thesis competition. It's a skills development activity which challenges graduate students to explain their research, research that's often taken years, to a non-specialist audience. They get three minutes and not a second more. Developed by the University of Queensland in Australia in 2008, the concept and its adoption in numerous universities led to the development of an international competition of which this is a part. These are your judges today, and feel free to applaud as I introduce them individually. You needn't save your applause. We begin with the president of the University of Windsor, Dr. Alan Wildeman. who clearly you don't truly appreciate, at least not yet, but <laughs> we'll get to that. The Director of Alumni Affairs at the University of Windsor, Ms. Susan Lester. <laughs> Professor in the School of Arts and Creative Innovation and Research Leadership Chair in Music, Dr. Brent Lee. Professor Emeritus Nursing, University of Windsor, Dr. Sheila Cameron. <laughs> Television news anchor, CTV2 in Windsor, please welcome Jim Crichton. Jim. <laughs> and the Dean of the Faculty of Law at the University of Windsor, Professor Camille Cameron. Now the rules by which this competition will be carried out. Each of the presenters can use a single static PowerPoint slide, much like this one. No slide transitions, no animations, no movement of any description. The slide is to be presented from the beginning of the oration. No additional electronic media is permitted. No sound, no video files, anything of that nature. No additional props, no costumes, no musical instruments, no laboratory equipment are permitted. Presentations are limited to three minutes maximum. Competitors who exceed three minutes, if only by one second, are disqualified. 
they either go through the trap door or there's someone in the back with some cream pies who will rush to the front. Presentations are to be spoken word. No poems, no raps, no songs. They are considered to have commenced when a presenter starts his or her presentation through movement or speech. The decision of the adjudicating panel is final. And while I mention the adjudicating panel, you were all handed people's choice ballots when you entered the room. The criteria you use is entirely up to you, although we trust since you are educated people, you will honestly choose the presenter who was the best. All things being equal, feel free to choose your best friend. All things being equal, of course. That's only fair. The criteria by which the judging panel will work today, communication style. Was the thesis topic and its significance communicated in language appropriate to an intelligent but non-specialist audience? Did the presentation help the audience understand the research and engagement? Did the oration make the audience want to know more? Now what is at stake here for the first place finisher today? A $1,000 prize and a trip to the Ontario finals at Queen's University in Kingston. For the second place finisher, $500 and a trip to that same competition, and for the People's Choice Award winner, $250. And by the way, I neglected to introduce uh, the timer today. He's a professor of kinesiology here at the University of Windsor. His name is Dave Andrews. Dave, welcome. <laughs> Clearly the most popular member of the panel, by your applause. So enjoy the competition. You will learn something. That's what's really beautiful about this. Please welcome our first presenter. She's a doctoral student in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. Her name is Heather Filietro, and Heather's presentation is called Stretchable Electronics Cast in a New Light. Thank you, Tony. Okay, I noticed that all of you had cell phones when Tony mentioned to turn them off. And if any of you have ever experienced the horror of dropping and breaking your cell phone, then you know firsthand that cell phones are made out of rigid, glassy materials that are prone to cracking and shattering. In the future, however, cell phone screens and other electronic displays will be made on plastic, so they won't be as fragile. We'll be able to roll them up, fold them, and put them in our pocket. Some scientists are even taking it a step further by making electronics displays and screens on rubber. So they use these rigid pixels that are connected by stretchable metal wires. The pixels themselves don't stretch, but the wires that connect them do. This approach works if you're trying to make a display or a screen because you need a large number of small pixels concentrated in an area. But for large area um, lighting applications, such as light panels or signage or even light therapy treatment, which is used to activate a variety of chemotherapy drugs and even to treat skin conditions such as jaundice, we need to make the pixels larger. And these pixels need to stretch. You can imagine that a baby being treated with jaundice will be much more comfortable being wrapped in a blanket of light rather than being placed inside of an incubator lined with lights. My research focuses on the fabrication of stretchable, large area light emitting devices to achieve such applications. We start with a transparent silicone rubber material which is very soft. It's so soft you can laminate it onto your skin and wrap it around your body like a blanket. On top of this transparent silicone rubber, we deposit a very thin metal electrode which is so thin you can still see through it, which is important because the light needs to be able to exit through the bottom half of the device so that we can see it. On top of this, we deposit the light emitting chemical. This is where the light actually comes from. This material on its own does not stretch, but when we mix it with rubber, we can impart stretchability to that layer. Finally, we deposit the second electrode, which is a drop of liquid metal. When we hook up the two electrodes to a battery, a chemical reaction occurs within that light emitting chemical layer, and light is produced and exits out of the bottom half of the transparent side of the device. What we've been able to achieve is we can stretch these devices up to 27% before light emission is no longer observed. And we can twist them into all of these complex shapes and we still see a large area of light being emitted. This is the first example anywhere of a large area stretchable light emitting device which can operate at room temperature. And this is crucial if you're going to use it in applications involving skin because you don't want to risk burning or heating the skin, especially in the case of newborn babies. 
While we still have a long way to go before we can commercialize this, we're working on making the electrode materials more robust and more stretchable and lengthening the lifetime of light emitted so that we can achieve these types of applications in the future. Thank you. Well done, Heather, and we appreciate your enthusiasm. It's wonderful. Our next presenter is Sathi S. Viravalli. Sathi is a doctoral student in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, and the title of his presentation is Hydrogen Production from Low Value Waste. World is in midst of energy crisis. From an agriculture-based economy in the early 1800s, we moved to an industrial economy based on fossil fuels. And now, we are moving back to an agriculture-based fuel economy. One hope that we have for our future energy is on hydrogen, which is a clean and renewable source of energy. Scientists and politicians see hydrogen as an alternative to fossil fuels. So, producing this hydrogen by a sustainable process is what I am going to talk in my research. In my research, I have chosen switchgrass as a raw material, which is a perennial crop that is grown in Canada. Nearly 300 metric tons of this crop is being harvested every year. The energy yield of this crop is about 100 gigajoules per hectare. From this amount of energy, we can supply power to nearly five domestic households in Canada. Switchgrass is also abundant in sugars, but this cannot be directly used in the process. So, I have pressure crook by a process known as steam explosion to extract these sugars. The sugar extracted in this process is then fed to the bacteria contained in the wastewater to produce hydrogen. Apart from hydrogen, there are other valuable products such as ethanol and butanol that is being produced. The hydrogen produced can be stored and used as a fuel source in cars and automobiles. Currently, in Canada, British Columbia uses hydrogen as a source in fuel cell buses for the public transits. And also, NASA uses hydrogen as a fuel source in their space program. The significance of the process involves the ease of technology. And it does not require any other alternative source of energy as an external output, such as light. The hydrogen produced from this process is relatively of higher production rates that are able to meet our current energy demands in the commercial sector. In my research, I have produced nearly one gallon of hydrogen liquid equivalent from a biomass amount of 15 kilograms. Note that this biomass is of low economic and nutrition value. The key to use hydrogen as an energy source serves a clean and a greener environment for it has zero carbon emissions compared to other fossil fuels such as gasoline. Hydrogen can be produced from this low value biomass can help in the revivability of the local economy. Thank you. Thank you, Sathi. That is Sathi Viravalli, doctoral student in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Our next presenter is Moshtaba. Amadi Balotaki. Mostaba is a doctoral student in the Department of Mechanical Automotive and Materials Engineering. And the subject of his presentation is Constructive Aerodynamic Interaction of Vertical Access Wind Turbines. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm going to start my presentation with a fundamental question. Have you ever thought how uh, we are going to supply the word energy when the fossil fuels completely run out. In fact, uh, there is a great energy transition from fossil fuels to renewable energies. Uh, and uh, one of the main sources of the renewable energy is wind energy. Currently, uh, many governments are investing money on the wind market. A lot of companies are manufacturing wind turbines, and thousands of researchers are trying to improve the performance of the wind turbines available in the market. All of these points show, uh, shows that uh, uh, the wind industry is growing at a very fast pace, uh, which is very promising in the energy transition process. 
Uh, but as promisingly as that sounds, my supervisor and I believe that there is an important missing element in the current wind market design. Well, here's the challenge. Imagine 50 years from now, uh, there is no more fossil fuels. You live in a city where the dominant source of the energy is wind energy. You will find the city uh, surrounded by huge uh, power plant all over the uh, country. Uh, unfortunately, we will be facing such a situation if the wind market invests uh, uh, on the, these enormous wind turbines, as you have seen lots of them all over the country, for example, by the 401 road. Uh, these wind turbines, which are called uh, horizontal axis wind turbines, and you can see them in the left picture of my slide. Uh, these wind turbines occupy a lot of a space on the ground. So, uh, and uh, needs a lot of space. And, but unfortunately, this is not the whole story, and the situation is even worse. In fact, uh, since the first wind turbine uses more than 60% of the fresh wind energy, so the wind stream behind the first unit needs some distance to recover its energy to attack the next wind turbine. Uh, which, uh, so we need a lot of space uh, around each single wind turbine, that, which causes a serious challenge of land usage. On the other hand, we, uh, there is another kind of wind turbines called vertical axis wind turbine. As you, you can see them in the uh, right, side of my, uh, left, uh, right side of my presentation. Uh, these wind turbines are much smaller, both in diameter and height, and they require less space. For these wind turbines, the situation is even better. In fact, we are doing experimentation to prove these wind turbines have constructive aerodynamic interaction. This means when the fresh wind hits the first two counter-rotating wind turbines, the, uh, the wind stream between these two wind turbines got accelerated under the mixing process of these two machines. This accelerated wind could benefit the third wind turbine located downstream and the same process for the other wind turbines downstream. As an overall comparison, the maximum output possible power from the vertical axis wind turbine is three to 10 times higher than the horizontal axis wind turbines. Thank you. Thank you, Mushtaba. Our next presenter is a doctoral student in the Department of Psychology. And the title of her presentation is Prosody as a Moderator of the Relation Between Early Reading Achievement and Reading Intervention Outcome. Please welcome Jessica Menard. It's a long title, but essentially what I'm looking at for my dissertation work is the relationship between prosody and reading achievement. So prosody refers to the melodic and rhythmic aspects of oral language. So for example, prosody would be what indicates the difference between asking a question and making a statement. So for example, apple versus apple, or also um, indicating the difference between liking or disliking something using only your voice. So for example, raisins versus raisins, depending on how you feel about raisins. <laughs> Um, so, for my dissertation, I'm looking at prosody in the context of reading achievement. Um, the reading scores come from regular classroom measurements that are taken by teachers. In grade one, the teachers are looking at how many letter sounds the students can decode within one minute, can decode or can say within one minute. Um, and in grades two and three, the teachers are looking at how many words from a connected passage of text the students can read within one minute. Um, in terms of what I expect to find, I think that those students whose understanding and use of prosody is higher will start off higher at the beginning of the school year and will also make more considerable gains in reading across the school year. And those students whose understanding and use of prosody is lower will start off lower on reading in September and will also make less considerable gains in reading across the school year. So what I've found so far is that prosody is significantly correlated with reading achievement in grade one students, but not in grades two and three students. So this could be because um, the sample size is still quite small as the data is trending towards significance, or it could be that uh, the influence of prosody is most important in the younger grades. So that prosody has a greater effect when you're first learning to read, because that's when language becomes more important. 
Um, so this work is important because the identification of prosody as an important factor in learning to read could serve as a new point of intervention for remediating reading problems. So what this means is that if we can target prosody, the understanding and use of prosody in especially younger students, this could translate into important gains in their ability to learn how to read. Thank you. Very good, or very good. <laughs> Couldn't resist. Thank you, Jessica. Our next presenter is a doctoral student in the Department of Biological Sciences. And the title of her presentation is Great Lakes Undercover. Can fish evolve to survive pollution? Please welcome Rebecca Williams. So, who in this room hasn't wondered about the effects of pollution on Southern Ontario? I mean, there's a reason Windsor's known as the Dirty Dub. Let me ask you another question related to my thesis. Have you ever wondered about the effects of pollution on bodies of water? Specifically, the Detroit River and fish living therein? Let me illustrate a scenario. Picture fish in the Great Lakes at the very bottom of the water column, on top of sediment, where pollution is highly concentrated. Are you all wondering the same thing now? How do fish live there? How do they survive? Five years ago, we set out to answer this question. I'm studying a group of bottom-dwelling catfish known as the brown bullhead, who live in contaminated regions of the Great Lakes, to try and understand how it is that these fish are capable of withstanding such high levels of exposure to pollution. We know that they are capable of surviving because they live in these contaminated areas and reproduce annually. Overall, their population thrives. Initially, we had two theories as to how these fish might be surviving. Do they acclimate, meaning that each fish must adjust to levels of pollution in its area? Or do they adapt? evolving into populations who don't need to adjust because they have a built-in shield to protect them against pollution. We've been focusing specifically on information from one enzyme, cytochrome P450 or CYP1A1. CYP1A1 is related to pollution in two ways. Once pollution enters the body of an organism, it causes an increase in levels of CYP1A1. This enzyme is then responsible for the breakdown of pollutants in the body of an organism. Once pollutants are broken down, they can cause mutations. Mutations can have harmful effects on the body of an organism, such as the formation of tumors. Initially, we collected fish from clean and contaminated sites and exposed them to compounds that are commonly found in polluted areas. What would you expect to see? Well, if pollution is responsible for causing an increase in levels of pollutants, we expect that when fish are exposed to such compounds, we would see an increase in levels of this enzyme. In clean fish, we saw a typical response. When these fish were exposed to such compounds, levels of CYP1A1 did increase. In contaminated fish, however, we saw an atypical response. When these fish were exposed to such compounds, levels of CYP1A1 were unexpectedly low. What does this mean? Well, if fish from contaminated sites are showing low levels of CYP1A1, this is important because first, it means fewer pollutants are being broken down in the body of an organism. Second, if fewer pollutants are being broken down, fewer mutations are occurring. What's the significance? Overall, there must be a decrease in the frequency of tumors in contaminated fish populations. So as you can see, fish from contaminated sites have found a way to decrease the harmful effects of pollution by decreasing levels of CYP1A1. And by doing so, they have evolved to survive pollution. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Presenter number six is a doctoral student in the Department of Biological Sciences. The title of his presentation is Sex in a Single Gene, a Lesson from the Fruit Fly. Please welcome Osama Batia. Have you ever thought how you become a male or a female? I will repeat that. <laughs> If I screw up now, it's not my fault. Osama, <laughs> take, take a deep breath and revisit it. Uh, just one moment, Osama, sorry. There's something from um, Okay, 
Have you ever thought how you become a male or a female? During the last five years, I have been trying to understand how the decision that initiates the development of our sexual characteristics is made. Almost all of our characteristics are determined by factors that we receive from our parents. We call, we call these factors genes. Genes can determine how you look, how tall you are, your color, and your sex. Genes can also determine our behavior. In humans, there are 25,000 different genes. In my research, I used the Drosophila as a model organism to study sex determination and fertility. Drosophila offers an ideal system to study genetics, and they share a lot in common with the humans. I'm interested in a gene called CORT, which is important for female fertility. I noticed that CORT is only produced in the female egg and disappears rapidly after fertilization. I was curious to know why, should, why CORT should not be produced in later stages of development. To answer my curiosity, I made the transgenic flies that are able to, to produce CORT in all developmental stages. The result was exciting and surprising. We found that the forced production of, of court outside the egg caused all females to transform into males. On the top left of my slide, you can see what normal female look like. When we forced the production of court, all of them, they were switched into males. This was an incredible result that took us a while to understand. understand. Court has been known for the last 15 years as an important gene for female fertility and has never been implicated in sex determination. So if the addition of court causes female to male switch, what would happen if you do the opposite? What would happen if you take out court from the female egg? To do that, we made a mutation in the court gene and we've, we found that the male pro progeny were partially transformed into females. This confirms the role of court in sex determination and suggests that there are other genes that are important for sex determination yet to be discovered. At the end, our goal is not to change sex, but to trying to understand this important biological process and to identify all genes that regulate it. We discovered how amazingly the decision to become a male or a female depends on a single gene. So as I said before, we use a drosophila to study how human genes function. So it will be interesting to make transgenic flies use taking the human cord gene and to see if it, it would act in the similar way. So the next time you see a drosophila on a banana, please don't kill it. That drosoph drosophila may hold the secrets of our genome. Thank you. Thank you, Osama. Presenter number seven. is a doctoral student in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. His presentation is titled, From Your TV to the Lab, Exploring the Reactivity of Indium. And he would be Chris Allen. Chris? So indium, it may sound a little esoteric, but it's actually a lot more common than you might think. And that's because indium is a primary component in all LCD and touchscreen devices. So things such as your laptop or your smartphone all have indium inside of it. And because as the years go on, we get more and more of these devices, we generally let our older ones go to be recycled. So wouldn't it be great if we could do something with all this leftover indium? And that's really where my project comes in. What can we do with indium? So you can sort of think of indium as a fatter, heavier aluminum. It's beneath it in the periodic table, so it shares a lot of the same properties. But indium is actually a fairly benign metal. Um, and what I mean by that is it's fairly green. A lot of reactions, such as those towards pharmaceuticals, can be done in water, so we don't have to get rid of all this nasty organic solvent at the end of our reactions. Additionally, like I said, it's benign for the environment, so we don't have to worry about polluting it in case any gets out during our reactions, unlike other metals, such as platinum or mercury. So the indium that I work with can be thought of as an electron-rich indium. And in chemistry, the more electrons we have, the more things that we can do. For example, we can make polystyrene, which is the same thing as styrofoam, the things we get in our takeout containers, and we can use a very small amount of indium, as low as 1%, to generate a very long chain of polystyrene. Additionally, indium can actually insert itself into carbon-chlorine bonds. 
So the most common example of chlorinated solvents that you guys would know about are dry cleaning solvents, as well as chlorofluorocarbons, the things that come out of the old aerosol containers. And generally, these would be released into the environment and might cause great environmental impact, especially to the ozone. But with indium, we can degrade these through much safer means before we release them to the environment. Now, a lot of the time in the lab, we get sort of interesting results. I've been able to make polymers that have indium in the backbone themselves, and below zero degrees Celsius, we have our nice rigid polymer. And if we increase the temperature to above zero degrees, it breaks apart into smaller units. And if we cool it back down, it goes right back into its polymer conformation. Now, because we get all these different interesting results in the lab, wouldn't it be great if we could actually see what's going on? But you may recall from high school chemistry, you can't actually see the atoms or elements. Well, that was kind of a lie. We like to do that a lot in chemistry because there is a technique you can use to actually see what the atoms are. And it's called X-ray crystallography. So all today, people were telling me to break a leg, but if I actually did, I would go to the hospital, they'd take an X-ray and be able to see the broken bone. But with X-ray crystallography, we shine a very thin focus beam on our crystal and capture it with a type of film. And what that shows us through um, a very, very long process, usually an entire day, um, we can actually see what the atoms are and where they are, how far apart they are from other atoms, and different angles and energies and stuff like that. It's a very useful and indicative technique that I use all the time in the lab. So whether it's in your TV or in the lab, indium is in demand. Thank you. Well done, Chris. I miss lunch. You mentioned styrofoam food containers. Thank you very much for that. Our next presenter, presenter number eight, is a doctoral student in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. The title of his presentation is Converting Waste into Electricity. Please welcome Woodney Shua. First of all, let me ask you one question. Could you live without paper products? Some of you may say yes, and some of you may say no. When I say paper products, it includes tissue papers, newspapers, books, dollar bills, etc. Anyway, a recent study which has been carried out based on this specific question has clearly indicated that paper is always necessary and it should stay around. So, Paper and pulp industries will continue to live into the future. Mind you, my research is not about paper, but it is about a toxic liquid waste which is generated from these paper and pulp industries. This waste is called black liquor. Can you imagine, whenever one kilogram of paper is produced, seven kilograms of black liquor is produced at the same time. So, my, the objective of my research is to convert this black liquor into electricity. How? Let me take you through the process. You can also see the arrows on my slide. First, I took the black liquor, and I have added a titanium dioxide. It's a naturally available compound, and I took that mixture and I put it in a photoreactor. What is a photoreactor? A photoreactor is a device which works like a microwave oven which we use in our daily life to heat our food but it uses ultraviolet light. So, in the presence of titanium dioxide, the ultraviolet light has converted the black liquor into simpler organic compounds, just within four hours. So what I did, I took the simpler organic compounds and I put that one into a microbial fuel cell to produce energy. This, what is microbial fuel cell? A microbial fuel cell is a device which works like a battery which we use in our daily life. The main difference between battery and the microbial fuel cell is microbial fuel cell requires only bacteria and simple organic compounds to produce electricity. So I took the uh, simple organic chemicals which is produced from the photoreactor and the bacteria has converted this simpler organic compound into electricity. Therefore, in my research, I have converted the black liquor into electricity. Mind you, at the same time, this toxic liquid uh, substance is converted into simple compounds. That means 
I have avoided environmental pollution, which may be caused by this black liquor. Thank you very much. Well, uh, let's hear it for all eight presenters. Terrific jobs, all. Uh, raise your hand if you learned something today. Anything at all? I learned a lot of things over the past several days. I had the benefit of hearing each of the presenters uh, last week, but uh, they've all polished their presentations to the point where they were all, I think, um, they would all agree much better today. So well done to you all. Uh, I don't wish uh, this decision on the judging panel, but we're paying them handsomely uh, to determine our first and second place winners here today. I think they've each been given a bottle of water. <laughs> Spare no expense here. Um, Patty Weir and Allison Sampson will be uh, going among you to pick up your People's Choice ballots. So we would ask you to fill those out. Choose your favorite and perhaps just pass those down to the end of the line in which you are sitting, and uh, we'll tabulate those as well. This may take from 10 to 15 minutes to determine our winners, so uh, we uh, beg your patience, and we'll get back to you as soon as the winners are known. Thank you very much. And, uh, thank you all uh, very much for coming. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Congratulations to all of the presenters who did a great job. I think you'll agree. I said, I think you'll agree. <laughs> yes, there is more excitement here than just the women's basketball team, yes? But that was good too. The People's Choice Award, as chosen by you, will be presented by Allison Sampson, the Director of Graduate and Academic Services here at the University of Windsor. And you chose as your favorite, this presenter, gender neutral at this point, this presenter will receive $250 and uh, your congratulations, Heather Filiatro. In the media business, we call this the grip and grin shot. Grip, grin. <laughs> well done, Heather. Congratulations. University student, I think you'll find some use for the $250 prize. Of course you will. Our second place finisher, winner of a $500 prize and a trip to the Ontario finals to be held at Queen's University in Kingston next month. Uh, second place is chosen by our esteemed panel of judges. Again, handsomely rewarded with bottled water. Rebecca Williams. And Rebecca's prize is being presented by James Gauld, Associate Dean, Faculty of Graduate Studies here at the University of Windsor. Now, the champion of the civilized world, first place uh, finisher, winner of $1,000, and a trip to the provincial finals at Queen's University next month. And that winner is Chris Allen. Well done, Chris. Uh, just there is a bit of housekeeping to be done. Um, one of those things is uh, Patty Weir, Dean of Graduate Studies here at the University of Windsor, would like to have all eight presenters on the stage before you leave the room. Um, also, there's a reception that's going to be held in Salon C next door. Everybody is welcome. So if you'd like to uh, stop by, as I said, just next door, that will be getting underway momentarily. The last word here goes to Patty Weir. So before I introduce Patty to you, I want to say thank you for 
allowing me to be a part of this again. I just enjoyed the heck out of this. It was a great deal of fun. First year it's happened here at the University of Windsor, and look at the room. Next year is going to be bigger and better, I can assure you of that. Thank you very much. Uh, Patty Ware. Well, Windsor, you made me proud. This has been an awesome three days of 3MT for the first time at the University of Windsor. We have the most talented graduate students. I know when we get to Kingston at the end of April that we will be a very strong team. Uh, we will not post your videos on our website prior to going to Queen's so that we don't really play our card too quickly. Um, I need to thank a lot of people. Um, first off, my staff who are awesome, who made sure that this ran off without a hitch, uh, particularly Svetlana Georgieva for um, opening up the online registration and communicating everything with the participants as clearly as she did. To Alison Sampson, um, my right hand for making sure that everything was done on time and in the most efficient way possible. Thank you very much. Um, to my judges, uh, we had 12 different judges over the three days. I'm very thankful to our community members for their support. It's nice for our students to be exposed to prominent members of our community and to our um, esteemed colleagues at the university. And last, I need to thank Tony Doucette um, for being our MC. Tony has given up three afternoons, of a, which makes a very long day when you're on the early shift. Um, Tony, without you, this event would not have been quite so nice. You've done a wonderful job. Tony's enthusiasm and support started with the very first email when he wrote back and said, I'm intrigued. And so, Tony, from the bottom of our hearts, thank you very much for your professionalism and for your lighthearted banter. Thank you.